I think 12 when I first picked up the guitar and I picked it up as a as a vehicle to write songs and so that's really like where my basis was I, I like started like I was in like a rock band at first like just playing lead guitar and then that rock band broke all right everybody we got slender bodies here with us today what's going on guys yeah how's it going Going well. So we got ben Benji and Max of Slender Bodies, and man, you guys, uh, your guys' project really went from a, a bedroom project to a touring and streaming powerhouse, so I'm excited to hear the story. Uh, before we get into the new album and the festivals you guys will be playing and the, and the new music and your merch, uh, do you guys want to just let us know how you got into music? Yeah, I'll let Max go first. I'm going to let Max say, like, out. just to preface, like, we're definitely still a bedroom project. <laughs> you know, we just added the other things on to the side, which, yeah. you know, has been really fulfilling and actually really, it's really cool to kind of stick to our roots in the way that we produce and write the music. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how we started is like making music in our bedrooms. Like when I was like 14 years old, I just, you know, started making, you know, really terrible house beats in, you know, in my, in my bedroom. And it kind of slowly developed into me understanding how to use like production software better and better up until I went to college and actually met Ben. And in college, we were like, uh, you know, we were we were friends like that would spend time just working on music together. And, you know, he would come and like record acoustic stuff. And I had a really, you know, terrible studio set up in, in my dorm room with a couple speakers and like a little, little interface. And he would just come up and we'd, you know, record on, um, you know, on acoustic guitars and just kind of, you know, get my chops up. And I would actually spend a lot of time recording all sorts of people around the, uh, around the university up in Santa Cruz where we went. And it was just a, uh, it was just a great place for me to really get my chops up as a producer, as being able to like work on a lot of different genres and all sorts of different voices and try to get an understanding of how to just mold sound and get things sounding better and better. Um, I ended up leaving college two years into it to actually pursue music more seriously and then Benji stayed but we kept in touch kind of over the internet and that was kind of the birth of of us working on music remotely and, yeah as, yeah. as yeah. Max left school I decided to get more serious about because he went to school for audio engineering so I was like I wonder if there's a like a place at UC Santa Cruz where I can learn this as well and so they did have a music program with like studios and stuff so I applied and got in and essentially max became my teacher for like and like has been for like the past like five years or so i mean like most of what i know about audio engineering and production i learned from max or by working with max so we have this nice kind of like teach each other things relationship um that blossomed really out of us working remotely in those first couple of years of college yeah. yeah that's cool i mean i guess you could say you could have saved some money on tuition but then you wouldn't have met, met each other so <laughs> I, I guess uh everything happens for a reason it's a yeah. social tuition you know yeah <laughs> it, it really is i i like uh I, I love santa cruz um i knew some friends who, who went to uc santa cruz and uh so i used to visit there um quite what a was bit your favorite and, college uh, to visit uh mm -hmm. not not so much of the campus but uh the the surrounding areas oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. i yeah. uh you know uh, the the downtown area is cool um, it's beautiful up there for sure yeah yeah i have some good memories up there um so you guys both you know hang were you were you guys both into music though uh, pretty thoroughly before college or did it become something that that you really picked up steam in college i i was I think 12 when I first picked up the guitar and I picked it up as a as a vehicle to write songs and so that's really like where my basis was I, I like started like I was in like a rock band at first like just playing lead guitar and then that rock band broke up and me and my best friend um, from childhood started another rock band and then from that that rock band broke up and me and my other best friend who was around like we started like a third rock band so I had like three iterations of like kind of like grunge hardcore rock bands growing up but I never knew the ins and outs of recording I just tried to focus on songwriting and playing for the most part um so yeah I've been I've been in it for since I was 12 years old just about yeah my parents you... would always oh go ahead go ahead Max go ahead I was just gonna I was just gonna add to it, be like yeah like my parents have um always said that like I'd always really loved music so they put me into a piano class when I was super super young and I think that was kind of like my most formative 
of like understanding music and tonality and rhythm and all those things like when I was you know five or six years old and then you know being a six-year-old I was like I hate this and <laughs> two years later like I stopped playing um, and around when I was 12 I actually picked up the guitar and realized that I actually really loved that and kind of dove back into learning other instruments as well and picked up like how to play the drums got back into keys again and like um play you know playing bass and just kind of like picking picking up a bunch of instruments but definitely guitar has been like the core instrument that I've uh, picked up similar to Benji um to use for songwriting or just getting like ideas out there and that was definitely something we connected on whenever we had originally met and we would just like you know play music together just for fun yeah I feel like that's such a uh, common story the the early childhood piano lessons and then I don't like this <laughs> and oh, yeah. then later on actually learning something that you want to play and being like okay I do like music yeah yeah theory is really hard when you're you know you just have like you know object permanence and like you know memory permanence in your brain and you're just like really coming in your own as a child it's really hard to <laughs> feel like I'm gonna practice scales <laughs> yeah totally did uh did, were you in rock bands too Max or I mean picking up the guitar were you yeah. in a couple bands first in middle school, I definitely played in, like, some punk rock bands, but it was, you know, always very just garage bandy, like, sitting in, you know, a friend's garage, you know, playing music way too loudly, probably should have worn ear protection, but, you know, no regrets. I feel like those were really formative and just being able to play with other people. I'm sure we sounded terrible, but, you know, that's the, you know, that's that's where you start, and... <laughs> And I think you slowly develop into, you know, learning what actually does sound good and like, you know, finding rhythms with other players and stuff. And I think around that time when I was playing uh, with bands in middle school is when I was like, oh, like, I kind of want to learn how to record stuff because I think that'd be really cool. And we can start to get just like an idea of how to get sound from the air into speakers, essentially. Um Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, I mean, we all have or many of us have diverse tastes in music, but how do you guys go from both being in punk rock bands and rock bands to uh, making music that basically sounds like a blanket or a warm breeze? <laughs> um, I think that for me, it was a lot, of, it was a lot of exposure to different kinds of music when I went to college. Um, and even a little bit before, I remember the big, the big kicker for me was I was, 16 years old, I just had gotten my first car and my cousin gave me like one of those data discs of like, you know, you could stack like hundreds of songs on it at the time and you could burn burn CDs, but it was just a data disc. So I popped in my computer and I burned like four or five discs from that big mix. It was a, it was a playlist basically. And so it was all just indie music. It was all like Death Cab for Cutie. It was all like Freelance Whales. It was like Seeger Ross, like all this stuff I'd never been exposed to before. And that changed, you know, being super interested in songwriting, but really getting it from, you know, I guess a young age, like it was a lot of Paul Simon Fleetwood Mac from my mom. But um, when I started listening to the songs, I was listening to like a lot of Green Day. So that's where my songwriting taste was to indie music, which is all songwriting in a lot of ways, um, where it's not really about like the recording fidelity it really changed how I saw music and storytelling and kind of the different tones, especially like, yeah, like, Death Cat for Cutie and like Radiohead especially like changed how I saw the sonic landscape of like what I wanted to do. And going into college, I was exposed to like way more hip hop and R&B and all that just coalesced as well as electronic music. Like I hated on dance music a ton when I was a kid. And then as I went to college, I was like, this actually has a ton of merit and the depth of sounds that you can get in electronic music is, is infinite. And I thought that, that was really intriguing. Yeah. Did you, um, uh, did you and Max find a commonality in your music taste before you started making it? Or did you start kind of developing the, the sound as you guys were messing around? Well, Max actually like had the sound for Slender Bodies, like, and he approached me. He's like, I like, like, this is what I'm thinking of. Like here are the parameters, like falsetto vocals and guitar, like manipulated guitar, regular guitar, any type of guitar, like that's what we're going for. And that really set the foundation. It was easy to fall in step in that. Yeah. Yes. And I feel like, yeah, I mean, growing up, like my parents would listen to a ton of like Sade and Sting and kind of those. And I'm sure, you know, hearing that you're like, oh yeah, like I totally see the like the influence to like a certain extent. I think there is a lot of that 
um, R and B feeling, soft vocals, harmonies, all the things that like those artists do really well. And when I grew up, I got really, you know, I feel like my transition from listening to uh, hard rock and, you know, metal and whatever, and then like slowly shifting into like punk rock, into more of like an alternative rock, into more of an indie rock, and then discovering bands like Radiohead or, um, you know, Envy Corpse, which is a very indie band that I'm obsessed with. Um, so <laughs> bands like that, that like really like solidified, like, wow, like, this like really um crooning vocal that you know has like such like a longing thing but then tying it back into like these like suave r&b shade feelings and like the happy like huge harmonies of sting and i think looking back now like i could see how all those influences have like come to you know bring our music together into those tastes um but at the time you know it was just a co yeah like kind of coalescing all the you know hip-hop and r&b and rock and indie and just guitar based music that we listen to and and you know and essentially pop music as well um and just making this you know this sound that essentially became our own and i think that there was a through sharing music with each other i think that's been a huge point of point of contact for for this sound because not only like before the project were we sharing things that we were making but we were sharing like other artists we were interested in and i think um, one of the most formative periods for this project was after Soto Voce and Fabulous had come out, I had moved down to LA and Max and I were going to songwriting and production sessions every day for like a year and some change. And so we'd have like 45 minutes to, you know, two hours driving into Culver City because of the traffic. We lived in Santa Clarita. So we were like just putting on different albums front to back and so playing stuff for each other. Um, I remember like getting like the the Beach Boys Pet Sounds um, CD and like putting that in. We just listened to that like front to back like a few times. And yeah, I think Max had some Shadi records as well. So we were just like letting all of these things sponge into ourselves and each other's brains to kind of see where we wanted to go next on an intuitive level, like not trying to like push it there on a verbal level, but just kind of soaking it all in and seeing what came out later. And it was fun how limiting it was, especially at the time, because I had an old BMW that had a single CD player and you had no aux and no, you know, nothing. So pretty much your only choice was to listen to albums front to back. So we'd always buy CDs and listen to listen to records front to back. And I think that was one of the reasons that we got so um, attached to writing like albums rather than being more of a singles band. Like we just love the idea of a collection of music that you can sit down and like completely dive into rather than it being like a three minute single that you're just like, that's great. But then there's nothing to like really settle into afterwards. Yeah, I do miss that listening to whole albums. You know, it's something we've, uh, I think culturally got away from, um, but uh, there's still a, those bands now and then that you can pop in a whole album and, and just listen to it. Or you, you know, you know them by name and you're like, I'm gonna listen to this whole thing. But yeah, back when CDs were, still being sold prevalently you put that cd in the car and you would just let it be in the, your car for like a week or something like that or a couple of weeks yeah. you know and you just listen to it over and over mm -hmm. uh, but yeah i definitely see the influences i love me some sade and sting so that's cool um mm -hmm. and and it's funny how commuting as much as it sucks sometimes uh sometimes you miss it uh you know like uh because it does give you that that kind of passive active listening time it's like uh your your you your brain has to be awake enough to to be driving so you're alert but at the same time you it's passive enough that you can listen to these things and actually yeah. talk about them absolutely yeah that is definitely something i miss of about you know about dr the commute but i definitely do not miss the la traffic yeah the commute itself was not a vibe <laughs> right this so when you guys were working on that that first album, did you guys know you were on to something? Because when you put it out, um, it, it was greatly received. Um, so as you were putting the finishing touches on it, were you like, I think we got something here? I mean, we thought it was cool, but it was a it was a passion project. Like we never intended to play any. We never intended to play live. Like period. Like full stop. Like we did this project as a creative haven for the both of us to just have a project where we got to make music together. And so 
all of those songs for Soda Veche, you know, all of them were written within that like month and a half where we, we started up like Max sent me Sublime and Gray. And then we just went to work like every week. It'd be like a song, two songs, and we put it together. He came to Santa Cruz. We finished up mixing and mastering, and then we just released it on the internet. And we're like, cool. Now we can share this with our friends and family. Like we've been talking about it to some of them. Like now they can hear it. Like that's neat. And like, I remember I was like on submit hub and I submitted it to like a couple blogs or something. I was like, might as well, like see what happens. But it wasn't like, dang, like we got the heat. Like we're gonna, you know, really just like blast off with this. We were like, that was super fun. Like let's do our due diligence and like put it out on Spotify and like submit it to some blogs and like then, you know, probably, probably walk away and then like do something else later. We had no idea it was gonna, this yeah. was gonna happen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure like we, we were just, we put it out and I wouldn't say we forgot about it because we were really excited about the music, but we definitely were not actively like looking at numbers or anything. And I'm pretty sure like a few months later, one of our friends like messaged us or something yeah. and was like, yeah, like one of, one of your songs is like really going off on, on Spotify. And we were like, oh, <laughs> and like, kind of like, that was kind of when we first started like diving into it. Like, oh wow, like people are actually really listening to this stuff. Um, and you know we were we were already writing new material at the time we had kind of dove into like ideas for fabulous and we were like we want like i want to write a second project for this again the whole like the album mentality the story mentality we were constantly like what's the next album like what's the next concept so we had like some demos and stuff ready but once that started happening we saw the first record really starting to uh take shape and like have this amazing organic growth we were like okay like we need to really prep to put something else out yeah, that's that's really cool that that it happened like that. Um, do you, I mean, only submitting a you know to some blogs and then just kind of not watching the numbers. Did you guys attribute the early uh, kind of uh, traction from? Was there a, a certain playlist or a certain blog that that you think really brought you to the next level that that got you to that wider audience that really started the snowball going? We got put on fresh finds on Spotify and I think that that did spread the snowball. But at the same time, like looking like once that happened, like once our friend was like, hey, your song is like really doing the thing on Spotify. Like I remember looking back on SoundCloud and like people had reposted it. So like I don't know what the catalyst was or who the catalyst was. Um, it really did just kind of seem like a shot in the dark. And like that's why I feel like I always like kind of point back to just like immense gratitude and luck and like, yeah. you know. I think we're I think we're like immensely lucky to be honest. Totally. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So, yeah. so you guys put out this album. It uh, it does great, um, unexpectedly, seemingly, um, and you know now you guys have racked up millions of streams. Um, even with that album, I think you did, um, and that was with no label or, or radio support. And when did you start seeing the transition from wow, we're getting a lot of streams to oh, we're going to go on tour or play some shows with uh, Muramasa and Passion Pit or, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about that transition from, wow, we got some traction to, to doing these great tours and, and, and festivals. So I feel like it was a very, very kind of nosedive right into it, which was really interesting because um, we, we had started getting some interest just from like management and labels and stuff kind of as we were working on the second project but we didn't end up signing anything for another two projects which was which was really cool so fabulous ended up coming out um well we did do a like kind of like a a very like light deal with majestic casual which we were huge fans of out in germany and we loved all the music and i was actually probably a very big influence in our tastes and like how you know how our um sound had evolved like and i was just like this is amazing. They're interested. They had reached out to us and I was just like, I've been listening to them since I was like 16 years old. Like this would be so cool to just put out an album with them. So they helped us promote Fabulous. And whatever it did, it did something because Anemone just kind of took off. And it was kind of like, it had a, had a life of its own. And that was not even really the song we were trying to push. It was kind of like interesting because when we had first put out the record, we were like, we should really push Little Islands as like the lead single because we really loved that song and everybody really loved that song. And then Anemone ended up being the one that was like, just like started. I remember like when that song came out and I think in the first month it had like, you know, two or three million plays and we were like, 
oh okay like and then it was like and it just like kept going up faster and faster and we were like oh like to totally didn't see this coming but like um and that one just really took a life of its own and i think that's when we really started seeing serious interest from a lot of labels and yada yada and like um and again we didn't sign anything until after we released fabulous extended which was essentially fabulous was always meant to be a 10 track record um but we ended up splitting it into two five track eps for i don't know what reason i honestly think it's just because the second five tracks weren't ready at the time and they just didn't hold up to the first five so <laughs> Um, it, the way that it led us there was kind of um, interesting but yeah after we put out Fabulous Extended we pretty much had an offer from Passion Pit to come on a tour with them in nine days we had never played a show before in our lives awesome. and the tour was starting in nine days <laughs> so I remember us wow basically running around town trying to get all the gear we needed in time because obviously like we couldn't order everything from the internet it just like wouldn't have made it in time like so we were just going to like obscure audio shops trying to find like in-ear monitors or like you know whatever we literally else. didn't like, know what we needed we were like calling friends being like we're about to do you know this <laughs> night tour. Like, like, like what do we need yeah that's so. that's amazing and hilarious <laughs> you know it's like maybe calling up some musician friends who've been working for a long time and just being like uh, I, i've never been on tour before uh but passion pit wants me to tour with them so <laughs> what do i need yeah, yeah we, were, was... we were playing some like four or five thousand cap rooms i remember like which was just insane for that to be like our first ever i think the only show we had done before that was a so far sounds where we played in like a living room well, we played Mur we oh, played we that Muramasa. You're right. We did Muramasa before we did the Passion Pit tour. And that yeah. was, I mean, even that, that was, was that was like a 500 cap room. Yeah. Yeah, but at the time it was, I was like, that was also insane. Like I had a, I had a hood on the whole concert because I couldn't handle looking at the crowd. <laughs> that was huge. Uh, yeah, and uh, then a few months after that, yeah, we had we got the offer for the Passion Pit thing, and we were like. Yeah, because I think that first show, we really just run and gunned it, and we kind of just used the gear that they had. and Yeah, it was out. literally, it was tracks. I don't think we had ears. I think we were just, like, listening. In the monitors. Uh, yeah, yeah to, the, to monitors facing us. And, yeah, it was just, like, but, it, and that was a whirlwind, too. I think that had happened. We're, like, and they're, like, in, you know, in two weeks, we have a spot for you or something like that. Um, so, yeah, Nosedive is a really good way to put it. It just kind of all happened and then kept rolling. I mean, once we did that Passion Pit tour, we got an offer to go on tour with Paris across um canada which was really special um, i feel like that was the first tour where we really put in our hours to like start understanding how to tour properly i agree like right the paris tour was it was a lot of shows i think it was like two or three months it was really long um and we ended up really get getting our chops i think during that tour um, and I feel like I'll never forget that experience because it was just like, it was literally me, Ben, and our, our really good friend and tour manager, Alex Tatum. And he was, you know, he was the tour father. Like, he was, like, so good at, like, what he was doing. He had never tour managed before. And he's just, like, you know, he's, you know, he's a 26-year-old, literally the biggest dad vibes you'll ever get. It's great. <laughs> uh, well, that's good to have some dad vibes with the uh, with the tour dad. Yeah, it kept us safe, you know, we all, we were all taking turns driving. We, we were in a Toyota Tacoma. Yeah. For, you know, over 10,000 miles um, <laughs> with all of our stuff yeah. in the back. I think we might've broke 12,000 miles by the I time believe. we got home. It was crazy. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, it's fun to reminisce on that tour. Cause we really did go through a lot. Those Tacomas go. I was just talking to a friend of mine. We were like, those Toyota Tacomas last. I still see Toyota Tacomas from like the year 2000 driving around and they look oh, fine, yeah. you know? <laughs> Yeah, I love. I, I I still have that Tacoma. It still still runs like a charm. So still kicking, <laughs> still kicking. Um, so uh, so did, and then did you say that you got you got approached by bigger labels after these tours, um, and 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 eventually signed? Yeah. So prior to putting out uh, Komarebi, well, and Soraya, um, this was like a fun you know backstory thing, like. We were originally prepping to release Komarebi and we were shopping it to labels and it was pretty much ready at the time and we were, yeah, we were shopping labels at the, and then we ended up signing a deal with our label currently, which is Avant Garden, 
um, which is an indie label that became a subsidiary of Island Records under Universal. So it was kind of like this like subsidiary of subsidiary thing, but it was really cool. And actually, when we, once we signed, we were like, oh, we should do an EP first before we put out Comerby, and that's kind of where Soraya was born. We were already writing some songs for it and whatnot, and we had actually um, pulled certain songs from our older catalog and totally reproduced them in the new style because I was actually listening to... Um, that new, I guess it's not new anymore, but the new Arcade Monkeys record, um, Arctic Monkeys. I was like, that's two different bands. Yeah, yeah I was Arctic. like, oh, is this some band I haven't heard of? <laughs> I was like, no, I just mixed two different bands. Yeah, Arctic Monkeys record. It was the hotel, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name of the record. Arctic, Arctic Monkeys. It was it's called. The one, the it's like two two records ago. It was kind of like a. Hotel and Casino. That's the yeah. one. Yeah. So I was absolutely obsessed with just the sound, like the sound design of that on that record, and the way that it just like felt, and I, I was just like, yeah, like that. Um, I want to write something that like has that type of like weird vocal effect, really just warm and thick. And I think that's where that's where Sor Soraya was born out of like us wanting to do a new EP before uh, the record came out, and and just uh, you know me just loving that like sonic atmosphere. Um, and we had pulled some songs like Take You Home, which was actually written for Fabulous, and we just didn't like the way that we had produced it at the time, so it ended up not making the cut, but we knew the songwriting was really good. Um, so we totally reproduced it from scratch for Soraya, and it was like the perfect fit just with that sonic atmosphere. Um, so we ended up putting that out under Island Records, and then six months or eight months later, I can't remember the exact timeline, we put out Komarebi, which was like our first real album even though like when you really look at it it's like Soto Voce was technically an album though a short one and then Fabulous if you look at the two parts was like another album and then Soraya was the EP and then we had Kobarebi which was you know in our eyes like our third album but in the eyes of like the way that you know we had the music out was like our first album um, which I love that record I think that's one that was heavily inspired by uh, just the forest and Santa Cruz and actually us returning back up there to, to write and that most of that record was written in Northern California um, so it just like ties back to our roots in a really in a really humbling way right what I, I guess some artists uh, might wonder you guys seemingly were doing so well um, independently uh, was did, what were some of the um advantages that you saw with the with the label that very you, familiar with the team we were very familiar with the team I mean, we we'd known avant garden um the people there for for many years um Pretty much since and, we were writing fabulous we had known them okay so, we weren't really working with them heavily but yeah we had known them um so that was that was a big a big factor and yeah i mean at the it just it's it's it seemed like the move for for me personally i think a, a huge part of it was like um you know like growing growing up i always like was watching like almost famous and like other like you know movies about like um being a professional musician and again almost famous is like a strange example because there's so much about like the the darker side or like the more um, great movie though yeah yeah, it's a great movie, but um, you know, I wanted I wanted the record deal. I thought that was like a really cool thing, um, and I thought it was accomplishment really to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. It's, it was a big accomplishment, and so I think that that was a huge motivating example, and also to to go through it to know, you know, what what a major label system can do, and like really to just like explore that because it's not an opportunity that everybody gets. It's it's something that again I feel very lucky and grateful for um and it, like you know i just wanted to i wanted to see it would happen because you know we were we were doing well independently but we at that at that point like really wanted to take it to the next level and like continue to boost in music our music and grow and like be able to have really special music videos like you know the one for belong and arrival that are on that record and um major labels they help with that you know like having having a, a budget like really helps like we weren't you know, raking it in at that point, we need, we needed a team in a lot of ways. Right. right. So that, so the label did help, uh, getting kind of being able to front some of that money for, for some of the visual, yeah, um, visions absolutely. you guys had. Um, I mean, they were the ones and, you know, 
we we are very specific i would say about how we try to roll out our visuals and how we want our aesthetic to be um portrayed but they were the ones who introduced us to like avant-garde specifically like they knew savannah said and at the time she was working for pulse films so that's how we met her um and yeah like there there was a lot of there there has been a lot of great stuff that's come out of this deal i would say in terms of like direction and um yeah support like some of the like definitely like we needed you know like help marketing and like what I, I'm not, we're not social media gurus. Like we need some like assistance there. Like when we go on tour, like what's the, you know, obviously we have agents with UTA and stuff like that, but like we were still getting like support, like moral support and just like a bunch of good stuff during that, during that tour, especially with Kamarebi. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, just, I think at the time it made a ton of sense. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it sounds like some of the stuff um, that initially happened might've been up uh, might have happened out of chance and and maybe having a label would would leave less up to chance and, and more up to a team yeah i mean i think that's kind of the idea it's like as we grow up musically and you know temporally physically um we want to be more calculated i think sure. in how we go about this project because you know and it's and it's kind of evident in our sound like so the voce is like it, it does have its own sound but like to us it was very eclectic it was almost chaotic in the way that it was written it was very much like you know a vomit of like our collective art and as we've gone along it's been a little bit more technical going into each record whether that's a con a defined concept or whether that's a defined like kind of sonic space or whether that's saying we want to break all the rules and just like go for something yeah. totally so you guys tell us about the new album are we and then i know you also are already working on new music so maybe tell us a little bit about are we and then and where you're headed from there sure yeah um are we is what in our minds you know it was a it was a pretty much like a in a way like a, we were trying to straight straight shoot for a pop record but one that still felt true to us and so um you know, we wrote some songs like early last year, right as we were heading into kind of the height of the pandemic um, and realized that, you know, it was time to break some rules. It was trying to bust out some synthesizers, trying to put some live drums on this stuff. Um, you know, time to get some full, full voice vocals and pair that with the falsetto. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, conceptually, the, the the title of the record speaks for itself in the way that it allowed us to ask, you know, ask questions that, you know, we could explore for ourselves. You know, are we pop songwriters or, you know, are we, you know, whatever activists or are we, you know, any, any anything that you can like end that sentence with just allows you um, or or start that sentence with like, who are we or like, you know, like why are we doing you know what we're doing like all these like questions that you can really like break break down and um and allow yourself to answer them through the music was like a really interesting um way to move forward with it and i think because of that there's a lot of firsts on this record because you know every time we asked ourselves like are we a band that likes to use synthesizers or not are we a band that likes to sing with full voice or not are we a band that likes to collaborate with other artists and i think that's why you'd see like the first time we ever used, did collaborations the first time we've ever used like other instruments other than guitars and like the first time we've you know incorporated all of these things is because we wanted to ask ourselves and explore the possibility of those being something that can continue to be an identity of slender bodies i love that and and so we can listen to that already. It's out. Um, when can we expect new music? Very, very soon. music. Very, very soon. We've had some more collaborations um, in like since, you know, we were wrapping up Are We? And so we're going to start trying to put those out. I'm going to stay, you know, a little bit candid and uh, keep it close to the chest. But um, it's coming very soon. And it's still in that similar world as Are We? It's almost like um, an extension or like a bridge to what we're doing next. and. As far as like full fledged project that we're doing next, we we have a pretty good sense, but we're still exploring it. I think that's the most important part. Um, but we're excited. We're very, we are very, very excited. Stuff, yeah, we're really excited. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. You're putting out a whole album, already working on new music, and you guys got a tour coming up in August with Louis the Child. That's exciting. Is that the first uh, live shows back since the pandemic, or have you guys been doing some stuff uh, in between? That'll be our first show with people. Yeah. Wow. Very yeah, cool. We had our live stream a kind of release party where we played a show, and that was kind of our first time just playing music live since, yeah, since the pandemic started. And that was really cool because we were we're bringing on a new drummer uh who's who's been absolutely fantastic and we've been really excited to work with him and yeah so the first time we're going to be doing some real uh some real uh shows with people with a crowd and everything will be the loose the child shows in august so, so yeah we're looking forward to it yeah we'll be on that those four dates of the euphoria tour um i believe around let me look on my calendar i think there it's like go. august 18 yeah it is yeah yeah 18 19 20 21 and then we'll be back on the road to do life is beautiful in september as well as we're playing red rocks with big gigantic in september as well awesome and uh tell us a little bit about your merch uh because you guys have some new exclusive merch yeah so this is stuff that we you know on one of those other questions that we asked ourselves in the middle of this was are we graphic designers are we you know, fashion fashionistas or fashion designers. And so it was kind of a passion project for, for Max and I to be able to design these. Like we'd always wanted to make like, you know, really nice, like kind of low batch quantity stuff that's very special and limited edition. So um, we made this merch set um, and they all go together and they feature the album art, but we have it embroidered really nicely um, through our merch company. Um, we handpicked all of the, the blanks from this website called AS Color, and it's all eco-friendly stuff. Um, and then, yeah, like, so all the positioning and all of the design and lettering and all that stuff was stuff we, we designed ourselves, and we're only selling a finite quantity of them, like, less than 150, I think. So we're running a pre-order right now, and literally, they won't be made again. So we're, it's kind of an exciting thing to be, like, putting out collectors items i guess or like merch that we're like really excited about that we want to wear um yeah. but like low batch and like high high quality i guess yeah i love the idea of constantly asking are we and then most of the time it sounds like the answer is yes <laughs> and, then, yeah. and if it's no then you throw it away and you move on but uh but exactly. it sounds like most of what you guys have, are putting out is uh is concluding that yes you do like synthesizers you do like singing with full voice sometimes <laughs> You yeah, like acting and like you uh, until you try it, right? And I think that's like the main idea behind like yeah. actually exploring everything is you know you you would never know unless you know you did it and then and yeah there are some things that we did really enjoy about this process and other things that we learned that we didn't like as much and I think that's been like a really eye opening experience for us and something that we will probably continue to do as we continue to make more music is continue to ask ourselves the are we question and continue to build upon our identities in that way. Yeah, I think are we is like a practice because you gotta explore it. You, it's about it's about a journey. It's not just a reflective question. It is a active practice. Yeah, are we? We're is gonna a... keep asking ourselves, are we? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, congratulations, guys, on all the success. What an amazing story. Um, we like to end the interview by asking if you had one piece of advice for aspiring artists, what would it be? I always say just get music out there the best you know like I think a lot of artists spend so much time trying to put out the perfect piece of music and that does not exist so just put yeah. out anything that you're excited about because I think others will be excited about it um, and you know I think you'll learn as you go and I think your music will get better and you know if you're proud of it then don't be afraid to show the world I would absolutely second that that's why we're here doing this I, I would love to know about your guys's work ethic uh because especially being a, a group that lo likes to put out albums um you know that's that can seem daunting to some people um I, I, tell, talk talk to maybe finish the interview by letting us know a little bit about your work ethic and how you how have such a high output um I always say that I'm like a completionist perfectionist. So I think that kind of helps tie into like, I need to finish it, but I also need it to be perfect. So that 
<laughs> I think that helps like in us rounding out music, but I don't know if you want to add to that, Benji. Yeah, so I mean, I think that I've definitely picked up a lot of um, attention to detail skills from working with Max, but I'm, I'm, I'm also a completionist. And I think that's what binds us. I think that's why we work super well together. At the same time, I'm very gentle with myself. Or I have learned to be more gentle with myself over the years of like, you know, if the pressure is on really hot, like really asking myself, like, is it on hot because there's a deadline or am I just like putting this like unneeded pressure on myself? Um, I treat creativity as a friend and like, I really try to like see it as like a physical being that I interact with. And I say, well, like, would I treat my friend this way? Would I demand that my friend come, o- come over all the time, even when I'm not like really that stoked to see my friend. Um, if I'm having a bad day or a hard time, then I, I do just like give myself space or I'll, I'll do something like painting or drawing. Um, and that helps me. But I think the thing that helps my work ethic is that music is literally one of the most fun things to me. And so in like completing something is really fun and the process of working to complete something is also really fun. And so the whole thing just seems really gratifying and validating. And so that's what keeps me coming back is that I've never, I've rarely had a bad day working on music there's always been something redeeming and there's always been something that's lovely and that's made me feel good yeah i love i love the idea of marrying the idea of being a perfectionist and a completist you know it's like apply that perfectionism to a desire to complete you know what i mean it's like i have to be a perfectionist about making sure to complete something um yeah so I, I do love I do love that um, that insight. Bring me the best world.